Hi, this is Vicki. Um, today I'm going to be going through slides 1 through 16 of the ethics PowerPoint. So ethics in nursing is really important in the care that we provide. Um, ethics isn't a black and white issue. It's a lot of times gray and nurses become really um, unsure sometimes of the things that should or shouldn't be occurring. So it's really important. We're going to first take a um, step here today and talk about the nursing code of ethics. So the code of ethics is really a written code of professional values and standards of, of conduct. Um, it provides a framework for decision making. Um, it really defines ethical principles that govern a particular profession. Um, and when we think of the code of ethics, the code of ethics encompasses all pertinent laws. So if it is um, not legal to do, the code of ethics also um, speaks to that. Um, a, the Code of Ethics is a guideline of general statements, and it doesn't give uh, specific answers, answers to possible ethical dilemmas. So it's really, when we look at the Code of Ethics, it's not going to tell you exactly what you need to do in each situation, but it'll mere act as a guidance tool for you to use. Um, so if there is an ethical dilemma that you are involved in, it's always good to refer to the Code of Ethics as well as speak with your manager, supervisor, or ethics team when you're in the hospital. Uh, ideally, a professional, uh, professional Code of Ethics should be reviewed uh, periodically and be updated to reflect the needs of changing society. So as we have progressed over the years, things and standards um, have changed. Um, what nursing has done 10 years ago is much different than um, what we did or what we do today. So the Code of Ethics is continually being updated and reviewed and um, you know, tweaked to, to adjust to society. Um, the Code of Ethics for Nursing was really created by the American Nursing Association, or the ANA, um, and it was adopted, it's our adopted Code of Ethics for the nursing profession. Other um, countries do have Codes of Ethics, but the Code of Ethics um, that the ANA has created has really be, been the bar and the benchmark. So it's oftentimes referred to and used and um, referenced upon. So on this slide, you'll see here that um, this was a poll that occurred in 2010, and it was really ranking the ethical, um, the public's view of um, ethical professions in uh, the United States. And as you can see, the public uh, ranked nursing as the highest ethical profession. I find it ironic how we are ahead of um, many of, uh, you know, our pharmacists, our medical doctors. And so, in knowing that, um, it speaks highly to to providing professional practice and knowing our code of ethics and adhering to them and when you um, see things that aren't correct that you're speaking up and taking action so that the public um, continues to see nurses um, in an ethical um, as withholding a high ethical standard of patient care. So now I'm going to go ahead and we'll start speaking to the actual ANA Code of Ethics. Um, for this course, you are not mandated to buy the Code of Ethics, um, but it is for sale and it's located on the ANA's website. Um, I have included it in Blackboard and you can look through that, um, but you are not required to purchase the actual ANA Code of Ethics for this course. I would highly and strongly suggest you do take a look at the Code of Ethics um, as I'm hoping that most facilities that you will someday work for um, will have a code of ethics available for you to reference as needed. So um, when we look at the code of ethics, there's really nine provisions um, that speak to the standards in which we are upheld to. Uh, provision one um, merely speaks about respect. So the nurse in all professional relationship practices with compassion and respect for the inherent dignity, worth, and uniqueness of every individual unrestricted by considerations of social or economic status personal attributes, or the nature of the health problems. So when we really think of respect for human dignity, it's the respect of the human rights, uh, human rights of all individuals. You know, our relationships with our patients are uh, very important. We as nurses must treat each patient um, individually, looking at their um, circumstances, looking at their families, 
um, you know, families and patients are usually one. So we need to be in, um, ensuring that we are consistently aware and respect the patient. Um, and also we need to look at the nature of the health problems. So as nurses, we are to care for all patients regardless of their medical problems. Um, we are advocates for the delivery of dignified and human care and we really provide care across the healthcare spectrum. So we as nurses, you know, may go into nursing and look at uh, promotion of health. We may be in the field in which we're preventing um, prevention of illness. Maybe we're in the hospital and we're restoring or we're trying to get those patients back to a state of health health, or maybe we're working in a palliative care setting in which we're alleviating suffering, suffering or supporting um, supportive care for those who are dying or the family members and helping support and, and make the transition um, you know, easier for both the patient and the family. Um, but in this provision one, they also speak to the right um, of self-determination. So patients have the right to self-autonomy, which really means that they can make their own decisions. Um, patients must be provided accurate, uh, complete, and understandable information in a manner that facilitates an informed judgment. So when we look at patients, um, patients have the right to self to determine um, if the care that um, the physician has offered, you know, they have the right to say that's not what I want to do. But in being that, they need to make sure that they know the benefits, the burdens, and the available options and treatment um, if they would receive the treatment or if they deny the treatment that's being offered to them. Um, autonomy can be revoked um, on a patient if a patient um, does pose a risk to society and we'll speak to that later um, when we talk about our six key concepts um, um, regarding ethics. And then our relationship, the last bullet, is really speaking about our relationship with colleagues and others. So we need to treat each other and our coworkers and our family, the patient's family and family with respect and compassion. So provision two really speaks to the commitment to the patient. Um, the nurse's primary commitment is to the patient, whether an individual, family, group, or community. So RNs must put the patient's interest first. And many times, like I stated, this will include the individual, family, but it can include maybe a, a smaller uh, group. Um, there are different um, ethnic backgrounds who have large groups of people who are um, really involved in the patient's care. So involving this a small group or potentially even a community. Um, plans, the plans that we do create as nurses must really reflect the uniqueness of a patient. And we also need to be advocates in that um, nurses seek to help um, resolve any conflicts that may occur. And a lot of times this can be done through a, t a collaborative practice type of nursing in which we're making sure we involve the right entities in a healthcare setting. Maybe it's um, discharge planning, social work, um, whatever that patient needs, we are being an advocate for that patient. Um, there are times when there's a um, conflicts of interest and we need to make sure that we examine the conflict and we try and resolve the conflict in a way that ensures a patient's safety and we also put the patient's best interest first and we preserve um, our own professional integrity. Um, sometimes we may not agree with the conflicts that occur, but many times we, as nurses, we need to be sure that we're putting our biases behind us um, and that we are really looking out for the patient's best interest. Um, we also will look under provision two for collaboration. So a collaboration, um, patient uh, care is centered around the patient. Um, nurses must work together with the healthcare team, much like I talked to about um, earlier about putting the patient's interests first. So really collaborating with spiritual services, discharge planning, maybe it's getting PT or OT involved, but it's really collaborating to ensure that we are providing the most accurate um, care um, that the patient needs in a holistic fashion. And then of course there's always professional boundaries. So nurses um, function within their scope, scope of practice. Um, we need to ensure that everything that we're doing, um, we've either been taught or it really lies in um, the standards in which we can complete. And we also need to make sure that, um, you know, that we provide a great deal into, of intimate care for nursing. Um, when we do nursing, you know, we um, do bandage changes, maybe we insert Foley's. And it's really important to be professional in all aspects um, so that the patient isn't um, being disrespected. 
Um, another uh, piece that's came up in recent years is really professional boundaries when it comes to social media. So putting things on Facebook about patient care or patient scenarios or situations really is a no-no and it's really um, uh, it's not something that you want to be doing. Many um, organizations have now um, put out strict policies that even if you're not, you know, you'd never want to um, implicate any patient, but even if you put on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, you know, I took care of a patient this afternoon that got into a motor vehicle accident, um, it could potentially be tied back to a patient. So you really should stay away from any of healthcare related um, issues or care that you've provided while you're working as a nurse um, to keep patients' safety or uh, keep patients' identity concealed. Okay, uh, provision three really speaks to the health of the patient and their rights. So the nurse promotes advocates for and strives to protect the health, safety, and rights of the patient. So when we look at privacy and confidentiality, um, they're really similar in that the nurse must always provide or protect a patient's right to privacy, um, especially in interesting cases. Maybe you have a patient who has a severe um, leg injury. You don't want to be sharing that with other nurses. That's the patient's privacy. Um, those involved in the patient care should be the only ones knowing of, of patient issues. Um, and when we speak of com confidentiality, it's really maintaining the trust. So the RN must mean, remain um, confidential with all patient information. And as nurses, we need to be really careful about this because we do give um, different kinds of report um, outside of patient rooms. And you always want to make sure... You always want to make sure that... Another person isn't another person isn't inadvertently overhearing another patient's medical history, treatment plan, um, whatever it is. So maybe shutting doors, just making sure that you're in a location in which um, patient information is uh, kept confidential. And then we look at uh, the protection of patients and research. So this may be medication trials. It may be genetical genetics. Um, research, maybe stem cell research, um, but each person who is involved in research has the right to choose whether or not to participate in research. And many times it, the, the, they have to be well informed and have an informed consent um, that's completed before um, starting a research trial. But a patient or a person does have the right to choose, yes, I do want to be in re a part of research, or no, I don't want to be in research. Um, when it refers to research, we also the patient also has the right to refuse experimental treatment, or they're able to withdraw. If they say, yes, I'd like to be involved in this research, they're um, able to withdraw at any time. So it could be at the second day of the research trial, it could be in the middle, or it could be two days from the completion of the research trial. But they are able to withdraw at any time. And then lastly, per, uh, patients who ex uh, participate in research also have the right to confidentiality. So many times when reports are generated post-research trial, um, patient information is protected. Names aren't included, date of birth not included, but the findings of the research trial are included, but it's never information that's actually tied back to a patient unless um, specific um, consent and things have been addressed with the patient. Um, and then we move to the standards and review mechanisms. So within each hospital, um, we have nurse educators and nurse administrators. And these um, individuals are really responsible for assuring knowledge and skills of each nurse. And then also incorporating evidence-based practice and things like shared governance and um, ways in which nurses within that organization or that unit can better improve their practice and um, incorporate um, the best evidence out there, uh, best evidence practice to um, support um, treating our patients correctly. But the nurse themselves also have a responsibility to maintain standards of professional practice. And they should be involved on different committees and review practices and then also seek to improve their own practice. Maybe that's by going to different conferences. Maybe that's um, receiving a critical care um, nursing magazine or the American Journal of Nursing magazine. But it's a way to stay um, up to date um, with um, changing practices of care. 
And then the last two, acting on questionable practice and then addressing impaired practice. So when we look at um, acting on questionable practice, the nurse must be alert to and take appropriate actions regarding any instances of incompetence, um, incompetent uh, nursing care, unethical, illegal, or impaired practice by any member of the healthcare team, um, which places really the patient's best interest in jeopardy. So when we look at that, we want to make sure that the person next to me, maybe it be the physician, maybe it be the nurse, maybe it be the respiratory therapist, if they're doing something that is with um, outside of the scope or they're not following a policy and procedure correctly, it is really on you to address them or if you don't feel comfortable doing that, it needs to be taken to a manager, director, supervisor um, to stop that um, questionable practice, practice um, from continuing so that we're not placing patients in the risk of, of you know, danger. And then lastly, addressing impaired practice. So as nurses, you need to be alert to any professionals who may be impaired um, because it really does put the patient's life in jeopardy. And by impaired, it can be maybe sleep deprivation. Maybe it's um, they're coming in and they have alcohol on their breath. Or maybe you're questioning whether they are um, using um, inappropriate drugs or medications um, in the wrong way or maybe they're on prescribed medications but it is affecting their ability to um, provide effective nursing care but you always want to be attuned to that and make sure that you address that with a supervisor or director okay provision four really speaks to respect so the nurse is responsible responsive and accountable for individual nursing practice and determines the appropriate delegation of tasks consistent with the nurse's obligation to provide optimal patient care. So when we look at acceptance and accountability and responsibility, nurses really hold primary responsibility for the nursing care that their patient receives and are individually accountable for their own practice. So this includes direct patient care, um, delegation, teaching, um, research, really anything that involves nursing and the, 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 um, the practices that you're accountable. Four, um, you know, many times we can question whether we're doing the right thing. And it's at that time that you really want to seek out um, different policies and procedures, or you want to consult maybe your supervisor, um, director, maybe the hospital supervisor. But if you're in question, make sure that you um, clarify and seek out the correct um, answer before you just go and do something. And I think this becomes especially important when you're floating to another unit. Um, if I am an ortho neural nurse and I need to um, float to a cardiac floor, I need to be um, sure to accept appropriate assignments um, because really once you accept that assignment, you are responsible for the patient or patient's um, care when you say, yes, I will float and yes, I will take that patient team. So it's really um, important um, to make sure that you are competent in the care that you provide. In a situation like that, um, I would make sure if I was the floating nurse, I would always have a resource nurse um, say, you know what, I'm not comfortable running a, a nitroglycerin drip. Um, but I will um, pair up with another nurse um, who maybe works on the cardiac floor and say, um, I'm not familiar with this nitroglycerin drip. I will not be I will not titrate it. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you the responsibility of the nitroglycerin drip. But I will I will take vitals every 15 minutes. I will come and find you if my blood pressure is below this value. If the patient has chest pain, and those are things that you need to work through. Um, but um, with that other nurse, but it's really having somebody to help you through that moment. And then we have the accountability and responsibility for nursing judgment and action. So accountability is to answer to oneself and others for your own actions. So nurses are accountable and responsible for judgments made and the actions taken in nursing practice. So it's just mean, really meaning that you need to assess your own competence. And if you are unsure, like I said before, you need to seek help. Um, when we speak to delegation, we need to make sure that um, when you're delegating a task, that the task that you're delegating is appropriate to the, dele to the person you're delegating to. Um, you always want to make sure that you follow up on delegated tasks because employer um, policies do not relieve the nurse of responsibility for making judgment about delegation and assignment of nursing care tasks. So an example, I'm a nurse working on a night shift. Uh, I have a patient who's needs a two o'clock blood sugar. The CNA, I've delegated the task for the CNA to go perform the, the blood glucose 
um, test, which is within her scope of practice, she goes and she um, takes the blood sugar and she reports back to me that the blood sugar is 45. It would not be appropriate for that CNA, for me to tell the CNA to go get orange juice while I sit there. It is my responsibility as a nurse to go and assess that patient and uh, ensure that the patient is not in any danger. So you just need to be really careful with delegation and that what you're asking CNAs to do or LPNs or any type of unlicensed um, healthcare provider that you're very clear on what they can and can't do when you delegate tasks. Provision 5 really speaks to the personal competence and our own value. So the nurse allows the same or I'm sorry, the nurse owes the same duties to self as to others, including responsibility to preserve the integrity and safety and to maintain competence and to continue personal and professional growth. So when we look at um, Provision 5, it's really speaking about moral self-respect. So um, you really need to pay your self-respect before others will respect you. You need to keep yourself healthy. You need to hold your bar high. You need to be treated with respect by others. And it is okay to demand respect from your patients when they step out of line. Um, if a patient is being inappropriate with you, you need to speak up and say that is inappropriate behavior or whatever it is that you need to do. But um, it is okay for you to, um, in, in um in a respectful and professional manner manner to um, demand respect for yourself. Now we also look at professional growth and maintenance of competence. So when we look at professional growth, it's really um, peer review and self-assessment that should be done minimally at once a year. And learning really is lifelong. Um, it doesn't mean that you per se have to go on for your bachelor's or master's degree, but you need to continue to grow. Healthcare changes daily, and you need to um, stay competent in the care that you're providing. And then we look at the wholeness of character. So sound ethical decision making requires the respect and open exchange of views between and among individuals and relevant um, interests. So that as a nurse, you must make sound decisions in your work and um, life without pressing these values onto others. So if you have a patient and you're not agreeing with their decisions, you as a nurse need to ensure that it's in the best interest of the patient. And if it's not, they need to be informed um, of what what is in the best interest and what will happen if they don't agree with it. And then the preservation of integrity. So just don't put yourself in a compromising position. Um, as a nurse, if you think, if you're not sure um, of an action that's going on, always think of the code of ethics. What's right? What is wrong? And uh, do the right thing for your patient and yourself. You never want to put yourself in a position that's going to, um, you know, potentially harm the patient or um, pose a risk to your nursing license. You've worked too hard for it. Okay, so provision six. So the nurse participates in establishing and maintaining and improving healthcare environment and conditions of employment conducive to the provision of quality healthcare and consistent with the values of the profession through individual and collective actions. So when we look at this provision six, it's really speaking about increasing quality in a healthcare facility. So when we look at the influence of the environment on moral virtues and values, virtues are really um, habits of character that uh, maybe predispose a person to do what's right. So a patient who has um, high virtue may be honest, have a lot of wisdom, courage. They really help a patient do what's right. So nurses really should promote habits as to create an environment that will ensure the values in, of human dignity, um, well-being. And then also we want to really improve their health situation or... Um, uh, do what's in the best interest of the patient. Um, maybe they're dying, but we need to provide effective pain management. And then we have the influence on the environment of um, ethical obligations. So nurses should be involved in policy and procedure writing. You know, maybe that's just as you start out being involved in working conditions or being a peer um, you know, making sure that the practices that are occurring on the unit are um, held up to the standard in which they should be. And then our responsibility for healthcare environment. So you yourself are responsible for contributing to the moral environment within the healthcare environment. Don't take shortcuts, you know, do the right thing. If you do something wrong, you know, let's say you're doing a sterile um, uh, a pick dressing. If you make shortcuts and other people see you and you think that that's right and now you've created the circle in which 
you know, maybe another new nurse can see you doing it and she thinks that's an okay practice to do. But this then leads to um, a vicious circle that can occur and it really starts putting the patients in danger because improper central venous access device um, dressing change, you know, has been shown to um, increase the chances of um, sepsis and infection. So it's the little things sometimes um, that are so important to maintain that um, ethical um, standard and doing what you're taught um, in school. Provision 7 really speaks to advancing the profession. So the nurse participates in the advancement of the uh, profession through contributions to practice, education, administration, and knowledge development. So it's really about, the whole of provision is about being involved, making a difference. You know, many times I think that as nurses you feel like you can't be involved because you're too new, but you really can be involved. Um, I am a, I have a fourth semester clinical right now on orthoneuro. And they have diff many different committees going on, but one is a TCAB, and it's they're really trying to trans. TCAB stands for transforming care at the bedside. So nurses are involved in looking at evidence-based practice and trying to improve the care that's involved, um, that they do to make it better for the patient. So really. When you look at these three bullets, it's about getting involved, being on a committee, helping shape the nursing practice that you're um, dedicated to. Okay, provision eight really speaks to health promotion. So the nurse collaborates with other health professions and the public in promoting community, national, and international efforts to meet health needs. So as a nurse, um, we must not only be concerned with the health needs within our community, but that of the world. You know, an example I, I was thinking of is, um, you know, many people are starving in Africa and there's environmental pollution uh, or there's environmental pollution that's really, it can affect the care and the health um, situation in different environments. Also, um, this, in the summer of 2011, there was a listeria outbreak because of cantaloupe that were, was grown in the United States. Um, I, and then I can't remember what state it was actually in. But if you were a nurse working in the emergency room, this was something that you'd want to be well aware of. If a patient comes in with abdominal pain, is nauseous and vomiting, um, could that be related to this listeria um, outbreak? You know, so it's really being well aware of what's going on, not only in your community, but that of the world. And then we have the responsibility to the public. So nurses must uh, be aware of the health status of the community and existing threats to health and safety. So as nurses, we educate the community and assist in any health care needs. And um, maybe a few of you can remember a few uh, years back, there was the H1N1 that was going going rampant through um, the United States. If the, clinic, if the clinics and hospitals hadn't been looking out into um, this, they would not have been prepared to be able to effectively care for the patients who came in with respiratory illnesses. So it's really being aware of um, what's going on in the community, what's going on in the world, what's going on um, internationally, and how can those um, instances or things that are occurring potentially affect um, the small communities that we live in and the care that we are going to prepare for um, so that we have we are more of a um, we are looking ahead versus being um, only ready in the moment. And then our last provision for the Code of Ethics is Provision 9. And this really speaks to the nursing values and promoting our, uh, promoting our profession. So the profession of nursing, as represented by association and their members, is responsible for articulating nursing values, for maintaining the integrity of the profession and its practice, and for shaping social policy. So it's really looking at these three big things, the assertion of value, so it's a responsibility of the professional association to communicate and affirm the values of the profession um, to its members. So, you know, when you become a member and you are a nurse, um, if things do change, the um, profession will communicate those to you. Um, and then we also need to be involved in social reform. And so some of us are really politically driven, and that's really getting involved in um, politics and tr trying to shape um, nursing at the bedside um, through political reform um, so that, you know, we don't have maybe CEOs or, you know, different people. It's really just getting involved so that we can shape our nursing future. 
So the next three slides are just key questions that um, you can look through and um, try to figure out. Um, and I hope that you've enjoyed this slideshow and that you understand um, the responsibilities of being a future nurse. And remember, if you're always if you're unsure if there is an ethical issue that has occurred, um, always speak or seek out the assistance of other people and then refer back to the Code of Ethics. Um, the Code of Ethics, as I stated, isn't going to give you a definite answer, but it will help guide your decision-making process.